is an EU accredited um, non profit think tank that specializes in the region and it's made mainly composed of academics researching the field. And their research focuses especially on terrorism, Indian Pakistani relations, and that's why they're here today, especially the conflict in the in Kashmir. Our first speaker is the founder and director of the organization, Mr. Junaid Qureshi. Um, he is originally from Kashmir and a writer and columnist and political an an analysis specializing in Indo-Pakistani relations. And he's going to talk to us about the history of the conflict and why this uh, still today matters to So please get, give a warm welcome to Mr. Junaid Qureshi. set something straight. It's not Kashmir, it's Jammu and Kashmir. <laughs> Kashmir is, um, is part of Jammu and Kashmir. We are talking about the princely state and I'm going to have it about the history of, of the princely state. Um, so Kashmir is one of the regions that you can see on the map as well of that, um, of that princely state. Now let, me talk, let me start off with a little bit of history. Kalhana, the 12th century Kashmiri philosopher who wrote the Rajdharangni as the river of, uh, of kings, an account of the history of Jammu and Kashmir, especially of the kings of Jammu and Kashmir. And he wrote about Kashmir, he said, Kashmir is a land which delights in insurrections. Um, that will make more sense at the end of what I have to say. At the same time, you know, it's very paradoxical, at the same time he said, this land may be conquered by the force of spiritual merits, but not by forces of soldiers. I wished that uh, the people who invaded Kashmir during its long history would have read him, uh, that they wouldn't succeed. Um, you know, the, Kashmir is a very, Jammu and Kashmir is a very specific region. It's made of, of um, I heard someone saying in the beginning that it had a Hindu Maharaja, at the time of um, India's, <coughs> British India's independence. Um, and it has Muslim majority subjects. We must not forget that it's a multi-ethnic, multi multi-religious uh, state. So it also has a lot of Buddhists. Uh, if you look at the map, there is an area of Ladakh, which is the biggest area. Uh, and those is made, that's made, mostly made up of Buddhists. And then you have the area of Jammu, which is to the south. Uh, which is mostly made up of Hindus. And um, it, it was founded by the royal Dobra dynasty in 1846. And when the British has left, Kashmir, or the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, found itself neither part of India or Pakistan. Um, you know, someone said here that the ruler um, could not decide, which is true. You know, what the problem with rulers is, um, and we, you know, many people keep calling it a Hindu ruler over Muslim subjects. True, uh, in some sense. Um, but rulers don't have a religion. The only religion of rulers is ruling. They are neither Hindus, they are not Muslims, uh, they are not Sikhs, they are not Christians, they just want to rule. The Maharaja of uh, Jammu and Kashmir wanted to stay independent, and I believe, and, and history shows that, uh, not because he didn't like India or Pakistan. He wanted to rule. He wanted to have his own country and be still the ruler. A decision was forced upon him, because when the British has left, Kashmir was many of the uh, princely states which was existing in, uh, in British India, uh, around 560 plus princely states. Legally, these were not part of British India. Uh, they, were, they were direct colonies of the British Empire, but technically and formally they were not part of, the, of British India. The rulers, when the British has left, the rulers were allowed, even before that, the rulers were allowed to govern their states independently, and by treaty, 
the British only controlled foreign policy and international relations. So the state of Jammu and Kashmir was ruled by the Dogra Maharaja. Dogra is, a, is an ethnicity, which is a Hindu Maharaja, under the paramountcy of British India. So when partition happened, the British Viceroy offered the princely states the right to accede either to India or to Pakistan. In theory, they could also remain independent. That's in theory. He, he wrote the letters telling them that it, it's, it's, the, it's, the Queen, it's, the, it's the British Empire's wish that they either accede to one of the dominions. The state of Jammu and Kashmir, as you can see on the map, it's contiguous to both India and Pakistan. And there was indeed this problem, which is that the ruler was Hindu, majority was Muslim. So what the ruler did, he didn't know. He, he, he wanted to stay independent. He wanted to maintain his, his, his dynasty. He wanted to maintain his state. So he delayed his decision. And he offered to sign standstill agreements, which in essence means that everything would continue as it was until he made a decision. And he offered these standstill agreements to India and to Pakistan. India called for further deliberations upon the, stand, upon the contents and wanted to talk about the, uh, um, the provisions in, in, in the standstill agreement. Pakistan signed it, which obliged Pakistan to um, continue the relation as it was before the British has left. So, on a very important, from 15th August, when British India, from Pakistan was 14th August, India, 15th August, from 15th August until 26th of October, Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir continued to be an independent princely state. That's for three months, August, September, two months, two and a half months. Um, until, on the 22nd of October, the state of Pakistan um, invaded Kashmir and Jammu provinces from the north, comprising tribesmen from Pakistan's northwest frontier province, which today is Khairul of Dukha. Um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but you can look at the people who invaded Jammu and Kashmir as um, the forefathers of the Taliban, the ancestors of the Taliban. Uh, and the army. Um, of Pakistan was also involved, and that's uh, conquered by, um, it was later in 84, 48, it was uh, said by the Pakistani foreign minister to the Yit Ansip, to the United Nations Commission for India and Pakistan, uh, and also written in General Akbar's book, Raiders in Kashmir, who was then a brigadier and who led the attack. So, the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir wanted to you know, safeguard his, his, his state, and he went to India for help um, on the 26th of October. India wanted to have a legal basis to enter Jammu and Kashmir. Um, why do you, Pakistan is attacking Jammu and Kashmir? They have a ruler, so it's their problem. It's, it's a problem of the ruler and the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So why should India intervene? So India asked for a legal basis and asked the Maharaja to sign us uh, an instrument of accession. Kashmir signed the instrument of accession like all other states did in, uh, which acceded to India. The difference is that Jammu and Kashmir only acceded to India. All other states later merged into India. Jammu and Kashmir never merged. The Maharaja also signed the instrument of uh, accession for only three subjects, which is foreign relations, currency, and defense. Any law passed by the Parliament of India has to be conquered by the State Assembly in Jammu and Kashmir to make it law, which is not related to these three subjects. So Kashmir retained a special position within the dominion of India. There's a lot of debate about it currently, also during the elections in India, uh, but the you know, the, the special status is still, is still there. So when the Maharaja agreed to accede Jammu and Kashmir to India, that's the first time in Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir's history after the Dogra took over that the legal status of Jammu and Kashmir was changed. 
flowing from this legality, the instrument of accession also obligates the Union of India to clear the state of Jammu and Kashmir from foreign forces, which it hasn't done until now. Part of Jammu and Kashmir is now divided between three countries, China, um, Pakistan, and India. While only one country has a legal claim, that legal claim has some strings attached to it, but there's only one country which has a legal claim. Consequently to the first Kashmir War, because the Indian states uh, accepted the instrument of accession and the army went in to clear the, the state from foreign invaders. But they stopped at what is now known as the LOC, the Line of Control. Um, and on the night of 1st of January 1948, Prime Minister of India, coincidentally a Kashmiri, Nehru, uh, called his forces and a formal ceasefire was declared as he approached the United Nations. He approached the United Nations Security Council to lodge a complaint pursuant to Article 35 under the UN Charter invoking the Security Council's dispute resolution capacity. So by the end of the war, when the ceasefire was called, India was able to clear the Kashmir Valley, Jammu and Ladakh, and the other regions which is Pakistan administered Jammu and Kashmir and Gilead Baltistan, comprising of around 34,000 square miles, came under Pakistani administration, which made the division of the erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir effect. Now there is a problem in this, you know, despite claims made by Pakistan, by virtue of having Gilead Baltistan and Pakistan administered Jammu and Kashmir under its administration, or claims made by India based on the instrument of accession, when the matter of Jammu and Kashmir went to the United Nations in 48, the matter of the whole state went to the UN, which meant that the state became disputed. It is still disputed. When two parties claim and both have a state under administration, it, it is disputed. So, then we come to the UN resolutions. I won't go into the into the real, you know, the numbers of the resolution. But, you know, uh, summarizing that, based on the UN resolutions, Pakistan agreed to withdraw the troops it had from the state of Jammu and Kashmir. That has never happened until today. So, because of that not happening. Um, the truce arrangements in the UN resolution could not be implemented. These truce arrangements are set forth in parts one and two of the United Nations Commission for India Pakistan's resolution of 13th August 1948, which stated that the withdrawal of Pakistani troops from the state of Jammu and Kashmir was the first step in implementing the other subsequent articles of the UN resolution. And because of non-compliance of the truce agreement, uh, in this case, by not withdrawing those forces, the question of a possible plebiscite was never revived at the UN level. Currently, the factual situation remains that these resolutions are not enforceable by the UN and are based on a choice between India and Pakistan. The UN resolutions clearly states after these steps have been, have been, have been implemented, so the, the, the forces have been withdrawn, and then there is a subsequent step, um, then India will withdraw bulk of its forces and will only contain a reasonable amount in the state of Jammu and Kashmir in order to maintain law and order, and then, then there, there will be a plebiscite. So a choice for the people of Jammu and Kashmir to choose between India or Pakistan. So there is no, in the UN resolution, it's not self-determination. That has become a problem. That's why it's not enforceable. When it does not allow unlimited self-determination, it becomes a choice with a limitation, not without limitation. So it does not fall under the UN Charter. If the uh, UN resolution were based on self-determination, like East Timor, 
then the UN Charter, under the UN Charter, the Secretary General could have moved the case at the UN level. Now he cannot. He needs the agreement of both the states to talk about general impression uh, on the UN level. Uh, choice without limitation. Uh, first of all, when the question of Kashmir was submitted to the United Nations, it was called the question of Jammu and Kashmir. Later on, um, the Pakistani foreign minister, uh, Zafrullah Khan, called for an amendment and uh, to substitute the, 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 the exact resolution when it was uh, put forward to the UN was um, the future status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir will be decided by a free and impartial plebs. These are exact words. The foreign minister of, uh, of Pakistan, um, he um, called for an amendment, uh, wrote a letter to the Secretary General to, s to inquire whether the words the future status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir could mean um, an independent Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, and the Secretary General replied to him, that, that in theory could be possible. And then he proposed an amendment replacing the words the future status of the state of Jammu and Kashmir by the following, the question of the accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India or Pakistan will be decided by a free and fair impartial person. So the choice, the, there is no choice without, there is a limit to the choice. You can choose between either two. That if there is no choice for self-determination in the resolution, it doesn't fall under the UN Charter. It falls under Article 5 of the UN's uh, complaint um, you know, uh, commission. Uh, so, and since then, the, the resolution has also changed into not being the question of Jammu and Kashmir, but Indo-Pakrash. So, you know, in, in between those two big countries, um, the UN couldn't make a difference anymore because it's not based on self determination. Like the Palestinian question, that is, there it is. It's taken up by the UN General Secretary. East Timor got independence. And so, but I'll, I'll go further because um, at the end you will realize that the UN resolutions do not matter anymore. The reason for that is that when two states uh, come to an agreement, the UN steps up. So after the 1965 war between India and Pakistan, India and Pakistan have mostly exclusively dealt on the issue of Jammu and Kashmir bilaterally. Both countries agreed themselves to put an end to the conflict uh, and resolve their differences by peaceful means through bilateral negotiations without any third party intervention. By signing the similar agreement in 1972, this was after the Bangladesh Liberation War of 1971. What does this similar agreement say? To progressively restore and normalize relations between the two countries, the de facto border would be called the line of control and would not be altered unilaterally irrespective of mutual differences or legal interpretations. The signing of the similar agreement essentially made Jammu and Kashmir dispute a bilateral one to be mutually resolved between the two countries and took it out of the purview of the United Nations or any other third party media. Because when two countries have conflict, they take it to the UN, and you know, in between, the two countries agree to having a bilateral solution, the UN steps up. Um, and that's a problem, because you know, the issue of Jammu and Kashmir has been intricated from the very outset. First of all, they accepted the UN resolutions, then they went back, signed a bilateral agreement, complying to uh, you know, solve it between themselves, um, a standstill agreement which was violated, an army coming in, the state divided. So both countries in that have been have been uh, have been uh, have been making uh, uh, mistakes uh, in in that issue. There have been many more bilateral agreements. Those are less important. This one is the most important. That in 40, 48, both countries accepted to. Uh, or India took it to the UN, became an international issue, the UN has to mediate, and then both countries in 72 decided to solve it by that. Coming to the other, um, this is a brief history of, 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 the, of the legality of the issue of Germany.
Now we have to, you know, I don't know whether Obama said it or not a few years ago. Um, he said that the, the solution to Jammu and Kashmir will come by, the solution to Afghanistan will come by having a regional approach. Uh, so not looking at Afghanistan only, but looking at the region. Um, and you've seen it now, and the Taliban controls what, 55, 60% of, of, of Afghanistan now after 18 years of war. Um, the problem for Jammu and Kashmir was that the problem came because of the region. Uh, and in this case, the Soviet-Afghan war. Uh, as you know, the Soviet-Afghan war was fought not only between the Soviet Union and, and, and and the Mujahideen of Afghanistan, the rest of the world was supporting the Mujahideen. After this war ended, it was Afghanistan was left in abundance of militant fighters, weapons, ammunition. Where do you take them? The Pakistani army has been had been involved with the Americans. They they got a lot of money and a lot of weapons to support these Mujahideen. Pakistan today has around what, one, two million Afghan refugees in Pakistan. They're struggling with that problem. So when this war ended, you have trained these Mujahideen for, for years. You have given them weapons. These are formidable fighters. They kicked out the Soviets, so they can't fight. So what do you do with them? The history between India and Pakistan has been, India is too big, a conventional war um, uh, will not be won by, uh, by, by Pakistan. In a war, you know, one can argue, do you have winners? But what happened in, uh, at the end of the 80s, this abundance of militant fighters were given a new arena to fight, which was Kashmir. Um, yes, there was a rigging in the 1987 election in Jammu and Kashmir, because of which people, the Kashmiri people, were unhappy, demoralized, at that moment maybe lost their faith in democracy, um, which gave the, 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 uh, the state of Pakistan an, 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 a perfect uh, opportunity to get these militant fighters, uh, Punjabis, Afghans, you name it, to send them to fight uh, in Kashmir. Um, and then youngsters from Jammu and Kashmir were crossing the Yellow Sea to the Pakistani part of Kashmir and were trained um, in guerrilla fighting for a week, two weeks, a month maybe, and sent back to fight Indian forces. Which they did, but you know, what, What's the chance of succeeding when you have had a training of, uh, of 20, 30 days against one of the biggest army, uh, armies in, uh, uh, in the world? And these were joined then by, uh, by Afghan fighters, Pakistani fighters. Uh, even fighters from Sudan have been in Kashmir to fight. And that has become a big problem for the Kashmiris. You know? I believe that the people of Jammu and Kashmir have genuine political grievances uh, towards Delhi, towards Islamabad, and now towards uh, Beijing. But the political issue of Jammu and Kashmir was, you know, contaminated by making it a religious issue. Um, fighters from Afghanistan, from uh, Pakistan, from Sudan, they have nothing to do with Jammu and Kashmir. You know, even if they succeed, what, the people of Jammu and Kashmir are going to be ruled by Afghans? It's, the issue is very regional. The, the, the grievances are also very regional, very ethnic. But this thing turned it into a very religious war. In the beginning, you had some people, you had, you had some organizations in Kashmir who were calling for a political solution in a political way. And then these, you know, today you might have heard about the Lashkar e Toiba, the Jashi Muhammad, the Hizbul Mujahideen. All these forces, they were called into being 
to fight in Germany and Kashmir and make it a religious war. Uh, they all call for, well, not all, but their, 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 their uh, short term aim is accession of Germany and Kashmir to the state of Pakistan on the basis that it has a Muslim majority population. Uh, that's the first initial short term aim. Long term aim is to make it an Islamic caliphate, which includes India, Pakistan, Germany, Kashmir, Afghanistan. Um, you know, I'm reminded of um, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, who, um, while describing Kashmir's composite culture based on communal harmony in Kashmir, you call it Kashmiriyat, which simply means Kashmiriness. Um, when he visited Jammu and Kashmir, he said, I don't understand what type of Muslims are found in Kashmir, because there appears no difference between them and Kashmiri Hindus. They share each other's customs and traditions to the extent that they celebrate each other's festivals together. So Kashmir was never radicalized. It, it, it's a very, it's a very you know, composite culture, or has been. So what these um, newly formed terrorist organizations started to do, they started to kill uh, the Kashmiri Muslim, uh, Hindus, which, is, uh, which, we, which they call the Kashmiri Pandits. It's the highest Brahmin caste of, of the Hindus. Um, also the only Brahmin caste which eats meat. <laughs> so, you know, Kashmiris cannot live without meat. Whether so, Muslim or Hindu, that, that doesn't matter. So, um, which made it a very religious issue. Now, you, now, if you move fast forward, now you also do not hear much about the political set settlement of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, these organizations call for the establishment of an Islamic caliphate. They call upon youngsters to pick up the gun or a stone. And when they do that, with the intention that they are fighting for religion, not for, for Jammu and Kashmir. There have been terrorist organizations which have said, whoever calls for the political settlement of Jammu and Kashmir is a traitor, is an anti-Muslim. That makes the issue very difficult to solve. Them. Because what do you do? And suddenly you have, Maybe you also cannot blame the, the common Kashmiri in this sense, I think. Um, you, know, you, have, you have youngsters from Brussels uh, leaving a social welfare state, going to Turkey, taking a bus and fighting with ISIS. So if ISIS can influence, can inspire youngsters from social welfare states like Belgium, like the UK, well, Kashmir is around the corner. And, 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 and the people of Jammu and Kashmir have been fed with this propaganda that the Afghans, you know, trampled uh, a world uh, superpower. Uh, and, and soon as the American leaves, um, this, this propaganda will be, will be only uh, increased. And then you have the Islamic Caliphate, ISIS. So from a religious issue, it now is, you know, digressing into a, a global jihad narrative. Um, Your Honor will talk about it in, in a while about, about the, about the uh, suicide bombing in, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir uh, uh, two months ago. That's the second suicide bombing in the history of Jammu and Kashmir, which also shows that for a long, long time, despite the violence, the Kashmiris were not willing to become part of the global jihad network. Yes, they were fighting. Yes, they were doing that in a wrong way. Yes, it was terrorism. But they kept it still regional. Now it has become they're, they're, the Kashmiri Muslim, or especially the people who, have, who, who are pursuing this global jihad narrative, they are more and more identifying themselves with the global Sunni um, uh, narrative of, of, of an Islamic caliphate. Now, when you have guns, you know, many people say that during these, during this, this, this insurgency, terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir, the uh, Indian Army 
or the Indian state committed human rights violations. There is no denying about that. Of course they did. It's a war. You know, um, so I'm not, still, even if it's a war, I don't condone it because the state should re react um, differently than a, than a terrorist. Um, but after 9-11, I don't know. When you call for religious warfare, especially Islamic terrorism, jihadism, it gives a free license almost to, to states operating there. Uh, the Americans went thousands of kilometers to Afghanistan and they, 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 they viewed it. Same happened in, in Iraq, and they're contemplating on doing the same in Iran. You know, if you keep the struggle, and that's, you know, I just talked historically as, as someone who is related in, in research on, uh, on the EFSA's platform, but moving a little bit to, to being a Kashmiri myself, I believe that we Kashmiris could have really garnered a lot of support for our genuine demands if we would have kept it peaceful and political. And if we would have defined it better. Because what is Jammu and Kashmir? This problem, this terrorism, insurgency, militancy, whatever you call it, is restricted to the valley of Jammu and Kashmir, which is you know, in the administered part by India, uh, a region of seven to nine districts. Um, the people of Ladakh, uh, they're not part of it. Uh, because of its religious nature, they're Buddhist. So they feel themselves very unsafe that if they succeed, where do we go? Same goes for uh, Jammu, the region which is uh, majority Hindu. They're also not part of it because they don't identify themselves with it. But it doesn't stop there, because you also have a big other part, which is on the administration of Pakistan and China. What happens to that? So the nationalist character of a struggle for Jammu and Kashmir was never defined by the Kashmiris, uh, by the people who, who, who wanted, to, uh, wanted to fight this. And what makes it now more, again, Nyan will also talk about that, what makes it now more difficult is China's entry. China is already controlling a part of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, but now they're going to build a, a, the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which will go through um, through Gilead Baltistan, which is legally an elemental part of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, and I hope I'm not taking too much of Yana's speech here. But um, legally, if I, if I want to talk, because I don't think she's doing that, but uh, in legal terms, when you have two parties disputing a region, and a third party comes in with $65 billion, build a corridor there, it becomes a stakeholder. It will demand ownership by virtue of its heavy investment in the region. And it will only impede the resolution of Jammu and Kashmir between India and Pakistan, and between the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So, this I don't, I don't know, you know, the Chinese have a lot of money, so maybe that's why, why, why nobody is talking about it. Um, but international law does not allow you to build huge infrastructures in a disputed territory. 100 years from now, let's say 100 years from now, India and Pakistan do come to a solution, the Chinese will ask their share, because that 65 billion will be how much in 100 years? So, the issue has become much more complex. And then the other issue is that many people have left in Jammu and Kashmir. So plebiscite, despite the fact that the plebiscite, the UN resolutions do not figure in the whole story anymore after the Simla agreement, a plebiscite is also very difficult to hold because the, the Kashmiri Hindus have left. They, they left Jammu and Kashmir. They are the original inhabitants of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, the, um, the Maharaja has con had constituted a state subject rule for all people in Jammu and Kashmir, which means that only the state subjects, only original people of Jammu and Kashmir, could live there, buy property, stay there. 
that's still guaranteed. Now there is a debate on it, and I think it's an election debate, it will not happen, but in the Constitution of India it's guaranteed by Article 370 and Article 35A. There is a debate on it that they want to revoke it and everything, but elections in India and Pakistan are very emotional. And many of the things the leaders promise they don't do. So this is one of them. Um, but this, this, this state subject rule was abrogated in Gilead, Pakistan in 1974. So for the last 35 years, more, 45 years, um, uh, people from other, people from Pakistan can reside in Gilead, Pakistan and buy property. Uh, can become part of, of that region. Um, so <coughs> even if you, you know, hypothetically would consider a plebiscite, the original inhabitants of Jammu and Kashmir are not to be found anymore. Um, not in Gilead, Pakistan, not the Kashmiri Hindus. Um, so that's very difficult. And then you, you might go for a regional thing, which is also very difficult because it, it, will, it will throw up different, different scenarios. Um, so I, I, I see you people asking the question, what's the solution? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I uh, I don't know I, I don't know what the solution is I, I I can give you what I what I think would create an atmosphere to get to a solution. One is the first and foremost thing is that terrorism needs to come to a halt. People in Jammu and Kashmir, whatever their political narrative is, should have the freedom to propagate their political non-violent narrative without fear for the gun, whichever gun, whether that's a terrorist gun or whether that's a state's gun. People should have the, um, the freedom to propagate political narratives. Um, and they need to give rent to their grievances, to their emotions, to their problems. At the same time, what needs to be understood, because when, whenever we hear about, and that was also you know, by the organizers, Kashmir, because we only hear about Kashmir, that is where the problem is. And we must not forget that Kashmir is not only the Kashmir bear. It's much more. So the second step, if you have a halt to terrorism, would be that the, Kashmir, that the people of Jammu and Kashmir start talking to each other, uh, try to build a consensus. Uh, cross LOC to also talk with the people uh, living on the other side of Jammu and Kashmir, with the people from Gilead Baltistan, with the people from Pakistan administered Jammu and Kashmir. There are no people living under the administration of, uh, of China, but it's still land, but uh, an intra Jammu and Kashmir dialogue between the people of Jammu and Kashmir in order to try to build a consensus, which will also facilitate people to people. And then, political narratives can flourish without the fear of the gun. And then only people can start looking uh, towards a solution. And, and most of the times, solutions are embedded in economic progress, uh, in um, you know, a society free from violence. Um, if solutions were, uh, were only drawing borders, uh, then uh, no country would invest uh, in healthcare, education, and other things, you know, you draw a border and then. So I think that the solution will come when, first of all, um, terrorism is put to a halt. And that puts us with a very different and a very difficult question. Will that happen? Um, look, we are, maybe history is going to repeat itself. I do not hope so. But 40 years ago, when, uh, 30 years ago, when the, uh, when the US left, you know, Kashmir had to face these Mujahideens and the Islamic radicalized terrorism and jihad narrative, uh, which has killed uh, uh, more than 100,000 people uh, in Germany and Kashmir. Indians, 
Kashmiris, Hindus, Muslims, anyone. Um, now the Americans are leaving in a rush. Um, 60, 55% is controlled by the Taliban. I do fear if the Taliban does not get the accommodation it wants in the government of Afghanistan, where do these fighters go? You have now a branch of the Islamic State in, uh, in South Asia, in Afghanistan. Um, we recently had the attacks in Sri Lanka, claimed by the IS. You have some people uh, who have uh, announced their allegiance to, to IS in, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. So where will they go? And the second part here, which is very important, What does the Pakistani military do? Look, objectively speaking, they are the key to, to halting this terrorism. If I was a Pakistani, uh, especially if I was in the military, I'll probably do that. It has a big chunk of the country's budget. It spends a lot of money. And it needs an enemy. You know, if you have peace with India, why do you need such a big enemy? It's not needed. That's the basic. When Pakistan was created, it inherited what? 17% of the landmass of British India. It inherited 10% of the institutions. It inherited 33% of the army. And from the onset, Pakistan's Constitution was signed in the 70s. Right, we talk. From the onset, the army has played a very big role. And uh, it suits the army's interest to have this limited proxy war with India and remain relevant. So, the mindset of the army what will happen with that? You know, now, when the talks of Afghanistan are happening, the Afghan government is excluded, and uh, and the and the, and the army is, is, is playing a, a big role in uh, in those talks. So, you know, the incompatibility between the Indian state and the people in Pakistan who run the state that is the main problem. So, in order to get terrorism stopped, what we actually should wish for is a stable Pakistan, is a Pakistan where democratic institutions flourish, where democracy is built, where democracy is supported, and where the army's role is only to defend the borders of the country, just like in other countries. You know, the famous quote, every country has an army, and the army of Pakistan has a country. That should change. That should change. It should become the army of the country. Uh, and then only we can move forward. And then only both countries can progress, flourish economically. Let's not forget, these are the same people who lived together 70, 80 years ago. They share cultural links, linguistic links, uh, you know, uh, lineages, languages, everything. So it's not that difficult. So I think that is the main step. We should encourage democratic, the building of democrat, democracy in Pakistan, democratic institution, and then no sane civil government will support uh, terrorism uh, like armies. I'll leave it at that, and uh, we'll have the question and answer. Thank you.